performance in facade systems. In today's presentation, we'll be discussing the types and functions of construction membranes commonly used in facade applications, along with the relevant legislations, regulations, and guidance documents that cover their use. We'll first look at these considerations in the context of the management of heat, air, and moisture in a building envelope and the impact the membrane specification can have on each. We'll then move on to consider the fire performance of membranes, how this is tested and categorized, and what requirements must be met. Let's begin by considering moisture management. In the UK and Ireland, the management of moisture in buildings is considered in Part C for England and Wales, Technical Handbook Section 3 in Scotland, and Technical Guidance Document F in the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland is also Part C, but this is a different document from the one used in England and Wales. While these four documents each have a slightly different focus and approach, when it comes to construction moisture control, they all refer designers to the same code of practice document, the British Standard BS 5250. BS 5250 was originally introduced in 1975 as a 25-page code of basic data for the design of buildings, the control of condensation in dwellings. Subsequent revisions in 1989, 2002 and 2011 increased the size of the document to well over 100 pages and built on the 1975 foundations to cover more types of construction and more detail around the internal external environmental conditions that are appropriate for use in calculations. The 2011 edition with 2016 amendments was also the final edition to maintain the original focus on the control of condensation. The new 2021 edition of BS5250 expands its scope to become management of moisture in buildings, code of practice, as well as streamlining the guidance and restructuring it into a more coherent document. This revision aims to address two factors increasingly placing buildings under moisture related stress. Firstly, the effects of climate change, leading to increased penetration of driven rain, more frequent, deeper and longer lasting flooding and increased atmospheric humidity that slows drying rates. Secondly, the effect of improved energy performance. This not only reduces the air exchanges through the building by reducing unplanned air movement, but also increases the levels of thermal insulation, making parts of the building fabric colder than they otherwise would be. Building on the 2017 BSI white paper, Moisture in Buildings and Integrated Approach to Risk Assessment and Guidance, BS 5250 2021 takes, more, takes a more holistic view of the effects of moisture on buildings and the strategies for its management. This reflects an increased understanding of the interlinked nature of hydrothermal effects. The first level of consideration, the building type, its use and occupancy, and the prevailing weather conditions lay out the basic factors that will influence successful hydrothermal design strategy. First, let's consider the fabric of the building itself. Of the three elements in the outer ring of design factors, it is this over which designers have the most control. As well as the locations of particular rooms and the orientation of windows, the basic materials the building is made from will also influence the hydrothermal response. A concrete building, for example, will have a higher initial moisture load from the water contained in the concrete itself. Over the longer term though, the higher thermal mass and capacity of the concrete to absorb and retain heat may provide a more efficient response to heating and cooling, depending on the building's purpose. In contrast, a largely timber structure, using cross laminated timber, for instance, will have lower moisture loadings initially, but will have less capacity to retain heat, so may require a different approach to HVAC system design. As with many aspects of design, there is no one size fits all solution that can be applied universally, but rather a balancing act of pros and cons that must be addressed together and in a full knowledge of the impact and influence of each decision on the others. The next part of the design must be to consider the external conditions, mainly influenced by local weather conditions. Although designers clearly cannot control the weather itself, the precise locations and orientation of the structure can have an effect. The position of surrounding structures and geographical features such as hills and cliffs can affect the anticipated wind loads, degree of shelter provided against wind-driven rain and snow. This, along with the orientation of the windows and the specific locations of rooms within the building, can also affect the potential for solar heat gain, which in turn will influence the heating or cooling requirements for the building. Perhaps most importantly, the design must fit 
the purpose of the building and the occupancy levels that it will experience in service. Higher occupancy buildings like residential structures or hotels will have different requirements for offices and retail buildings like department stores. These differences will be apparent in the differing internal conditions for temperature and humidity, and this will influence the moisture load on the building. At the end of the day, the building must be fit for purpose and must be designed to meet the role for which it is required. From a thorough understanding of the high level factors influencing the building's performance, we can then consider the fundamental interaction of heat, air and moisture movement through the fabric of the structure. It is important to consider the effect each has on the other, and the understanding the interlinked nature of these three criteria is key to a durable, sustainable and effective facade system. We can illustrate this simply by considering how heat flows through the wall section, as shown here. As we move outward, the temperature drops until it reaches the external temperature. Alongside this, air is able to retain varying quantities of moisture vapour depending upon its temperature. The temperature at which air loses the ability to transport vapour is known as its dew point. In our example here, the temperature gradient always remains above the dew point temperature, allowing moisture to be safely transferred to the outside environment. If the temperature drops to below the dew point, however, liquid condensation can occur. So by varying the temperature in the structure and the quantity of moisture present, we can optimize the design to ensure the dew point is not reached. Construction membranes play an important role here as they can modify the moisture transfer characteristics of the construction, limiting its ingress or ensuring its safe movement to outside. They can also help ensure excessive air movement does not create colder areas due to external air ingress or transport additional moisture by convection. BS5250 2021 defines two main types of membrane for use in facades. The first of these is the air and vapor control layer or AVCL. These membranes are both air and vapor tight and historically have been referred to as vapor barriers. However, in practice, they rarely constituted a complete barrier to the passage of vapor. So the term control layer is more appropriate. The purpose of these membranes is to both limit the movement of air and the associated transfer of heat and moisture by convection and reduce the moisture ingress into the structure by diffusion. Such membranes can only perform these functions if they are continuous and undamaged, so durability is a key consideration. Some AVCL membranes are reinforced with additional scrim layers such as glass fibre. These both reduce potential stretching and elongation and prevent any tears or punctures spreading across the membrane surface, both of which can increase moisture transfer. AVCLs are typically used internally on the warm side of any insulation. The other membrane type is a vapor permeable membrane, VPM, or a vapor permeable underlay, VPU. These membranes permit the passage of moisture in vapor form, but not as a liquid. They can, however, be either airtight or air open, depending upon the specification and purpose of the membrane. Because they do not trap or retain moisture, they can be considered moisture vapor neutral, meaning they can be placed almost anywhere in relation to the insulation, subject to the correct performance criteria being met. If used as an air barrier, this means they can be positioned in the optimum location to perform this function without being limited to the warm areas of the structure, as is the case with the AVCL. For this reason, VPMs are often used externally where they can provide temporary weather protection during construction or during the transportation of components. Across all types of membranes, however, it's important to ensure the correct material is placed in the correct location and the specified performance achieves the desired effect. To ensure the system's performance as intended, we can conduct hydrothermal analysis of these proposals to both verify performance and fine tune the design. There are two principal methods used for this and BS5250 2021 details when and where the use of each type is appropriate. The first of these methods is detailed in BSEN ISO 13788 2012 standard. Hydrothermal performance of building components and building elements, internal surface temperature to avoid critical surface humidity and interstitial condensation calculation methods. The method detailed in this standard is a form of steady state analysis known as the Glazer method. The first step in this analysis is a U-value calculation conducted using the BSE and ISO 6946 2017 standard. 
building components and building elements, thermal resistance and thermal transmittance calculation method. We'll talk more about what the U-value thermal conductivity and thermal resistance mean later in the presentation. But for now, what we need to know is that these properties establish the temperature gradient through the structure that we saw earlier. This temperature gradient is combined with the vapor transmission properties of each material in the construction to give us the basis for calculating the dew point temperatures at each interface between materials. Then any effects of thermal bridging, fixings, air gaps, and ventilation are accounted for using various correction factors. The conventions and guidance for these corrections are laid down in the BRE guidance document BR443, most recently issued in 2019. To determine the final dew point results, the BSEN ISO 13788-2012 method also requires the internal external environmental conditions that apply to the structure. Both BSEN ISO 13788-2012 and BS5250-2021 provide a range of suitable values to cover different building types and occupancy patterns, and there are a number of sources where site-specific external weather and climate data can be obtained. It's very important that the environmental data used in the calculation is appropriate to the situation under consideration and expert advice should be sought if necessary. Incorrect climate and environmental data can lead to unforeseen problems. For these values, the Glazer method produces an average temperature gradient and dew point graph for each month of the year, which allows for a simple to understand overview of the condensation risk throughout the year. The red lines here represent the temperature and the blue, the dew point. Because this method uses standardized libraries and a limited subset of physical properties for each material, this makes the Glazer method a great tool to check condensation risks quickly and simply, with comparatively little training or experience required to obtain accurate results for most common types of construction. There are, however, some limitations to the method. Firstly, the assessment can only model moisture flow from inside to outside, ignoring external moisture sources like weather. Secondly, it does not account for the capacity of materials to absorb, store and release moisture. The most detailed method for this type of assessment is one conducted using Wolfie software in accordance with the EN15026-2007 standard. This methodology uses dynamic numerical simulation to account for heat and moisture flows, as well as the capacity of building materials to store moisture. In contrast to the older and less detailed Glazer method calculations used by the EN13788-2012 standard, this dynamic assessment incorporates the effects of a full range of moisture sources, such as initial moisture loads and external weather, and can assess these effects over long periods of time rather than a simple annual cycle. This type of detailed assessment is important as it can be used to confirm the suitability of a range of solutions to control not just the movement of moisture, but also the movement of air. The EN15026-2012 method allows the moisture contents and relative humidity to be modeled and assessed at any point in the facade, allowing a far more detailed evaluation of the suitability of the specified materials to work together as a system. The downside to this assessment, though, is the lack of standardized environmental data, material properties, and conventions around thermal bridging effects and correction factors. It therefore requires a greater degree of skill and expertise to produce an accurate and appropriate result when compared to the more extensively documented Glazer method. Another good use for EN15026 is modeling non-standard environments, such as was the case at the Passive House Certified Leisure Centre at St Sidwell's Point in Exeter. To meet the strict energy requirements of the standard, the internal environment was heavily optimised to minimise heat losses from the heated pool water. By controlling the temperature and humidity precisely, the evaporation rates from the pools could be reduced, helping to lower the energy requirement. This optimised environment could be accurately assessed using the dynamic EN15026 method to ensure the building fabric and systems were able to control the moisture and heat loads effectively across the annual cycle and into the future. This model could also account for warming external conditions over the anticipated life cycle of the structure, helping to ensure long-term sustainability. This additional accuracy is critical to ensure that what is built matches what is modelled. BS5250-2021 defines the conditions as as-designed theoretical or ADT 
and as built in service or ABIS. Installer training and quality of workmanship are a fundamental part of achieving this. This more structured and well-defined approach to heat, air and moisture management aligns with the principles of the Construction Design and Management Regulations or CDM 2015. The CDM requirements are to sensibly plan the work so the risks involved are managed from start to finish, have the right people for the right job at the right time, cooperate and coordinate your work with others, have the right information about the risks and how they are being managed, communicate this information effectively to those who need to know, consult and engage with workers about the risks and how they are being managed. So we've seen how we approach defining and modeling the moisture transfer and structures and how this interlinked holistic approach to design is necessary to optimize designs to maximize performance. Let's now consider some of the factors influencing the flow of heat. Firstly, we must consider the insulation in the building fabric. This is the most obvious method of reducing heat loss, but can only function effectively if considered as part of the overall system. There are three principal properties to be aware of when considering thermal insulation performance. Firstly, thermal conductivity or lambda value is a measure of how well the material can transfer heat and is measured using watts per meter Kelvin. The lower this value is, the better a material will perform as insulation. Thermal insulation products typically have a thermal conductivity of between 0.015 and 0.044 watts per meter Kelvin. Thermal conductivity does not consider the thickness of a material, which makes it a good way to compare materials independently of how much material is used. Thermal resistance or R value incorporates the thickness of a material and is calculated by dividing the thermal conductivity by the thickness in meters. This gives a result in meters squared Kelvin per watt. From here, we can take the R value for all the constituent parts of the construction, add them together and take the inverse. This gives us the thermal transmittance or U value, which is a measure of how fast heat flows through the element. Lower U values indicate better performance, but unlike R value, U value are nonlinear. So halving the rate of heat loss does not simply mean doubling the thickness of insulation. As well as the basic U value calculation, we must also account for various factors which can further reduce the thermal performance. Firstly, we must correct for any situation where fixings are present through the insulation, or if there are air gaps which may allow a degree of thermal bypass around the insulation layers. These are typically accounted for using standardized values and correction factors which are detailed in the BRE guidance document BR443, the most recent edition of which was released in 2019. Secondly, we must adjust the U value for the element to account for repeating thermal bridges such as studs or rafters. If the correct data is available, this can be used. Otherwise, BR443 gives a typical representative value for a variety of situations. This is particularly important for facade systems and light steel and other metal elements, which usually have a higher thermal conductivity. So even if the bridging percentage is very small, it can still have a significant effect. Non-repeating thermal bridges such as corners, junctions, floor zones and other areas are dealt with using psi values, which can be calculated using methods and conventions outlined in BRE guidance document BR497 2016. These can also be supplied by product manufacturers or suitable default values can be used. Previously, it was also possible to use accredited construction details. However, these have not all been updated in line with current building regulations, so may no longer be acceptable in all areas of the UK, so should be used with caution. Finally, we must consider the movement of air. This can take the form of infiltration where cold air leaks in or exfiltration where warm air leaks out. Because of the non-linear nature of U values can mean unrealistic thicknesses are required to increase performance. So reducing the losses associated with air leakage is critical to successfully designing buildings with exceptionally low energy use. The first, stack pressure, arises from the stack effect in the building. This is an important driving force behind passive ventilation strategies. However, if not properly designed for, it can lead to air leakage problems. Stack pressure is caused by convection currents within the building 
where warmer air rising through the structure draws cold air in at the lower levels. The second, wind pressure, results from a difference in pressure between the windward and leeward sides of the building. The positive pressure on the upwind side pushes from outside to in, and the negative pressure downwind draws internal air outwards. Being driven by weather, the directionality, the extent of this pressure can vary considerably. We also have to consider the effects of shelter provided by surrounding structures and any variations that may occur between the upper and lower stories of the building. The final air pressure driver is mechanical pressure associated with ventilation and air conditioning systems. In high-rise residential and commercial structures, large-scale air handling equipment is capable of creating substantial pressure drops within the building. Natural sources produce pressures of up to 10 pascals, while mechanical systems can go as high as 60 pascals. If this is not managed correctly, it can, can contribute by drawing air into the building envelope from unintended sources. Additionally, if the system is not installed well, leaking ductwork may draw air into the system that has not been accounted for, with a corresponding detrimental effect on the efficiency of both the system and the building as a whole. Air tightness is addressed in the sections of building regulations relating to energy performance. This means approved document L in England and Wales, technical standard six in Scotland, technical booklet K in Northern Ireland, and guidance document L in the Republic of Ireland. In most of these cases, the energy performance requirements can be slightly different across the regulations and also vary with building use. Non-domestic structures such as offices or commercial properties are assessed differently from housing. In respect of air tightness, the regulations typically demand a pressure test be conducted to determine the level of air leakage and provide a method for incorporating this into the overall heat loss assessment. This involves either pressurizing or depressurizing the building to a pressure difference of 50 pascals, then measuring the airflow necessary to maintain this pressure. They typically also give a backstop or worst acceptable value. Depending upon the regulations, this backstop is typically around 7 to 10 cubic metres per square metre per hour. In the Republic of Ireland, the backstop is set at a maximum air leakage rate of 7 cubic metres per square metre per hour. In England and Wales, as of Part L 2021, it is 8 cubic metres per square metre per hour. In Northern Ireland, the value is 10 cubic metres per square metre per hour. In Scotland, a rate of 7 cubic metres per square metre per hour is used for target emission rate assessments and a rate of 10 cubic metres per square metre per hour or less is recommended. To put the effect this can have into context, let's set a baseline sap dwelling emission rate of 12.18 with an air leakage rate of 7 cubic metres per square metre per hour and a wall U value of 0.15 watts per square metre Kelvin. Assuming all else is equal, let's consider what changes are required to reduce the dwelling emission rate or DER by an equivalent amount using insulation versus air leakage rates. While this is a greatly simplified example and many other variables should be considered in reality, it serves to illustrate the general principles. Taking the air leakage rate to 0.5 cubic meters per square meter per hour, roughly comparable to the passive house standard, will reduce the dwelling emission rate by 6.9%. Achieving a similar reduction through fabric insulation would require a U-value of 0.05 watts per square meter Kelvin. Reducing the U-value to 0.05 watts per square meter Kelvin will require a significantly greater thickness of insulation, around 570 millimeters of typical fiber slab to be installed on the outside of the frame. This may also require extended fixings, flashings, and other ancillaries. Even assuming suitable fixings of such a length are readily available, the space and footprint implication of the walls this thick in a typical facade make this somewhat impractical. Getting the air leakage rate down to 0.5 instead allows a far more realistic wall buildup to be used, and in practice is not difficult to achieve as the increasing numbers of passive house certified buildings of all types globally can attest. Designing in air tightness first provides more flexibility for designers later, particularly in terms of material choices. For example, it may allow for thinner insulation boards to be used or a combustible rigid foam board to be replaced with less combustible but lower performing mineral fiber without affecting the energy efficiency.
This flexibility can only be fully utilized, however, if the designed air leakage can realistically be achieved on site. So a simple and robust air tightness strategy is important. Typically, the air leakage rate is reduced by using construction membranes to create an airtight line. Depending on the membrane used, the airtight line typically falls either internally, directly behind the internal linings, or externally behind the cladding. However, with the correct specification, there's no reason it cannot be placed somewhere between these two extremes. It's important to consider what physical properties a membrane used in each of these positions requires, and any solution should be verified by means of a condensation risk analysis, as we discussed earlier. Traditionally, these two functions would be performed by the same membrane, an air and vapor control layer, or AVCL. Most vapor control layers will also perform the function of an air barrier, but it is by no means a given that this method is suitable for all projects, particularly in facade systems. While an AVCL can reduce condensation risks, for some facade buildups, the vapor control function may not be necessary, and the inclusion of the vapor control layer simply adds an additional process and more complexity. If our overall design strategy is to simplify and reduce potential points of failure in the design, it's something worth bearing in mind. This is compounded by the sealing requirements for any systems used internally. As we can see here highlighted in blue, a modern building has a great many services and other penetrations that must be fully sealed if an internal AVCL is used. Features like service voids, flexible pipe and cable gaskets, and sealed light fittings can go some way to mitigating these risks, but these all increase costs and time demands and aren't necessarily familiar to all contractors. It can also take far longer on site to ensure every joint and penetration is adequately taped and sealed, often requiring several different types of tape for different circumstances. Acquiring all these tapes and sealants can also pose challenges if needed at short notice. Such issues can lead to improvisation on site in order to meet deadlines, which can in turn lead to pressure test failures and complex remediation. Moving the airtight line outwards in the construction requires a different material specification. The membrane used here must still be airtight. It must also permit the passage of water vapour in order to not trap moisture and increase condensation risks. In the intermediate position over the sheathing board between the structural frame and the outer insulation layers, the number of penetrations is reduced, as is the complexity of sealing what penetrations there are. This also facilitates straightforward sealing of complex curves and forms and means features such as floor zones and roof and wall junctions can be easily dealt with by simply wrapping the whole building in a single product. Intermediate or external air barrier membranes with self-adhered backings make sealing laps and joints simple and fast. Depending on the construction method, the membrane itself can also be fitted off site, allowing it to provide protection during transportation as well as during construction. Once the membrane is in place, the building shell is then wind and watertight so progress can be made on fitting out. And air pressure testing can be undertaken earlier in the build schedule, giving more flexibility on timings and potentially easier fixes to any problems that do arise. Work on services, either during construction or in the future, will also not affect the air barrier. The main differentiation in long-term maintenance between internal and external air barriers is the likely nature of works which may affect them. Internal air barriers may be affected by small-scale alterations or repair works undertaken on a more ad hoc basis by a range of contractors from skilled trades such as electricians and plumbers right through to general DIY. This makes it more likely that damage which does occur to the airtight barrier will not be properly repaired as these works may not be undertaken in full knowledge of the specification of the building or its materials. Damage during the initial construction process is easily identified using a smoke pencil during pressure tests and can be remedied using tape and if required, a patch of material. After construction though, this damage is harder to locate and while tape and patches will still correct the problem, access to make repairs can require removing large sections of internal finish. The provision of a service void can mitigate this to some extent, and proprietary gaskets and seals can reduce the risk of damage, but it's important that information on the location and specification of the air barrier layer is communicated to building managers and subsequent contractors to ensure they are used. 
By contrast, works undertaken on the external side of the envelope affecting the facade cladding system are more likely to be performed by specialist contractors as part of a more formal works package. This will be more likely to include desktop studies of the construction, method statements and other design work that would highlight the importance of the airtight line to the performance of the building as a whole. The vapour permeability of such an air barrier system also allows flexibility in insulation placement. It's perfectly possible, for example, to wrap a timber frame building with insulation between stud work in the membrane, then fit additional external insulation layers to limit cold bridging without causing any moisture problems. If the membrane also has a Euro class B reaction to fire rating, it means it can be used at all heights on all building types. We'll look at fire applications in greater detail in the next section. The primary benefit of a self-adhered external or intermediate air barrier system is not so much that it reduces the overall air leakage rate, more that it makes achieving design air leakage rates far easier and more reliable. This in turn allows the benefit of airtight construction to be fully accounted for and integrated into a holistic design without fear of extensive or expensive awkward remediations if targets are not met. Moving even further out, an additional membrane can be fitted over the insulation layers externally. While an air barrier can be used in this location, if an intermediate airtight line is specified, then air leakage performance is less critical externally. There is still some benefit, however, in reducing air movement through permeable fiber insulation layers. What is important in this position is that the membrane has good weather resistance and durability and achieves the specified requirement in relation to fire which we will discuss next. The fire performance of a facade system is addressed in Part B in England and Wales, Section 2 in Scotland, Part E in Northern Ireland, and Technical Guidance Document B in the Republic of Ireland. As always, there are some differences which we'll highlight, but we'll try to keep them as broadly applicable as we can. The Building Research Establishment's BR135 guidance document is also important when considering fire design as is Regulation 7, covering materials and workmanship. ADB and Regulation 7 have undergone several recent revisions, most recently in 2022, to clarify what was historically considered a somewhat ambiguous message around what exactly the requirements for materials entailed. When these were issued in August 2019, the redrafted versions clarified the language and content of the regulations to make the requirements unambiguous. Table 10.1 of approved document B defines reaction to fire requirements for different building types and the building height to which these apply. For relevant buildings, as defined in Regulation 7, Section 4, and residential purpose groups, this height is 11 metres. For most other types of building, this is set at 18 metres. The 11 metre height class was introduced for England and Wales in 2022. Although Regulation 7, Section 2 requires the main materials which become part of an external wall of relevant buildings and residential purpose groups to have a fire classification of A2S1D0 or A1 in accordance with BSEN 13501 Part 1 2018, there are several exemptions granted in Section 12.16 of Approved Document B, Volume 2, Section B4. Of relevant to our discussion today is 1216A, which states, membranes used as part of the external wall construction above ground level should achieve a minimum of class B S3D0. This exemption is partly in recognition that some materials such as vapor permeable membranes may not be able to achieve this fire class without severely compromising their essential functions. A similar exemption is provided in Scottish Technical Standard 2. The height at which this applies is also 11 meters. To quantify their behaviour in relation to fire, materials are classified using the standard BSEN 13501 Part 1 2018. This gives a Euro class rating between Class A1, which is non-combustible, and Class F for products which are either too combustible to pass any of the specified tests or which have not been tested. BSEN 13501 Part 1 2018 is not, however, a test standard, but rather a framework for interpreting data from other tests. The principal component tests used are ISO 11925 Part 2 2020, the ignitability of products subject to direct impingement of flame, Part 2 single flame source tests, 
which is used to determine how easily ignited a material is and can be used to place products in class F, class E or with additional testing classes B through to D. The next test standard, BSEN 13823-2020, Reaction to Fire Test for Building Products, is building products excluding floorings exposed to the thermal attack by a single burning item, which is shown in our illustration here, is used to determine the heat energy released by the combustion of a test sample, along with its smoke and droplet production. The test data allows products to be classified in classes from B through to class D. The last two tests, ISO 1182-2020, Reaction to Fire Test for Products, Non-Combustibility Tests, and ISO 1716-2018, Reaction to Fire Test for Products. Determination of the gross heat of combustion, calorific value, are used where materials are being assessed for classes A1 and A2, which are classed as having limited combustibility, under approved document B or non-combustible under Section 2 in Scotland. Taken together, these four standards and BSE in 13501 Part 1 2018 classify materials into these seven classes, from F, the most combustible, to A1, which is non-combustible. Euroclass determination works like this. The first part is the overall fire class. Class A1 materials are fully non-reactive when exposed to fire while those in class A2 have an extremely limited reaction in terms of smoke and droplet production. Class B products are combustible, but with a very limited contribution to the overall fire development. Classes C through to E products, increasingly large contributions to the fire development, with class F denoting materials which are easily flammable. Alongside this, the classification adds the S and D suffixes, denoting smoke emissions and droplet productions. S1 means smoke emissions is weak or absent, through to S3 meaning high intensity smoke production. Likewise, D0 is no droplets, while D2 mean high, le high levels of dripping. This simple and universal system makes comparisons of fire characteristics simple in regulatory terms, but it's not without problems, as the classes can accommodate a broad range of performance. The test also doesn't look at how the systems specified interact with each other in a fire situation. This video shows a comparison test between two materials achieving a Class B fire rating under the EN 13501 Part 1 2018 system. The intumescent coating on the membrane on the left hand side expands and provides a degree of protection to the OSB sheathing board beneath, limiting the potential for the fire to take hold. The standard Class B membrane on the right shrinks away from the fire, and while it does not contribute to the fire development, neither does it retard the growth of the fire. It's therefore important to look beyond the simple rating to consider the full scope of the material's performance and that of the system and installation as a whole. This test was conducted by the University of Edinburgh according to the methods given in UK, UK TFA Technical Paper 3, Schedule 2, Part 8 ignition test arrangements and is included purely to illustrate the differing responses to ignition between the two products shown. The University of Edinburgh's fire laboratory is not a UCAS accredited testing laboratory. As such, while testing is ex executed in accordance with the principles of relevant standards, the test results do not constitute certification and should not be used as such. Full fire test information should be made available by material suppliers and should be consulted in detail and any recommendations followed. The most recent test method used in the UK is the BS8414 test, revised in 2020. This test provides an alternative way to meet the combustibility requirements of the regulations for the external walls of buildings other than relevant buildings. As described in both volumes of the 2022 approved document B, specifically section 10.3 of ADB1 and section 12.3 of ADB2. BS8414 is the largest scale test commonly used and aims to give an accurate representation of the performance of a fully integrated wall assembly. And there are two variants related to facades, BS8414 BS8 part one, 2020, tests non-load bearing cladding systems supported by a masonry substrate and BS8414 Part 2 2020 
tests non-loading bearing systems supported by a steel frame. In essence, this test is a supersized single burning item test, and in this test, products are integrated into complete constructions representing the entire wall assembly. The fire source, called a crib, is inset at the bottom of the test structure to simulate a fire breaking out of a window and spreading up the facade. The BR135 guidance document uses the following model to illustrate the development of a fire, and it highlights this contextual approach very well. A rapid fire spread occurs when initial fire develops and flashes over, and is then spread to all areas simultaneously by the outer cladding layers, in turn starting fires across all areas of the building. Where fire spread is restricted, the initial fire develops and flashes over, but can only ignite a single secondary fire directly adjacently. The fire will only develop further if this secondary fire also develops. This is a much slower process and allows far more time to contain each area of fire and to evacuate the occupants. So that brings us to the end of the main part of today's presentation and to recap, we've seen how the hydrothermal factors in facade systems are interlinked and require a holistic approach to achieve a robust high performance design. This in-depth assessment of the applications and requirements requires good understanding and knowledge transfer throughout the design and build process. As system manufacturers, we engage with all parties involved from designers and regulators through to site operatives to ensure the as-built in service performance achieves what is being specified. To facilitate this, we provide a range of technical support services, beginning with hydrothermal assessments for all types of construction, using both the EN13788-2012 and EN15026-2007 methods. These assessments help to ensure the specified construction can deal with the moisture loads placed upon it and allows optimization of the material specification to ensure the most efficient envelope is achieved. To further simplify this, we provide a range of technical specifications through MBS Source and also an extensive library of BIM data. At the next stages, we can advise on detailing and markup drawings to illustrate the optimum approach for any given situation before undertaking toolbox talks with site operatives to ensure a high quality of installation is achieved. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our August webinar. My name is Pamela Howitt. I'm a um, senior technical advisor here at Proctors. And rather than being on the panel this week, um, I am your stand-in host for today. And I'll also be joining you um, in our next webinar in September, which I'll tell you about a bit later on this morning. If you've missed any of our webinar series, which have now been running since 2020, you can view them all on demand right here on our YouTube channel or through our learning hub um, on our website, which is accessible through www.proctorgroup.com. Um, you can also register for all of our um, special content on our members area, which is through our website. There are all our product libraries there, personalized CV certifi CPD certification available through um, our webinars. And you can also access our free online new value and condensation risk um, analysis software um, there as well. As always, um, please do request any product samples and contact us to arrange a follow-up meeting to discuss any specifics for your projects. Or you can continue to book one of our ever-expanding range of REBA um, assessed CPDs like the one this morning, and they cover a range of topics. These can be done either face-to-face -face in office, or if you've got distributed offices throughout the UK, you can look into having a, a virtual um, meeting with our team members um, over, over Teams or Zoom. We've received some questions already um, via email um, and by DM and in the YouTube chat. Thank you for that. Please send any more that you might have into webinar at proctorgroup.com. DM us or type them into the YouTube chat. Um, please do get in touch and we'll try and cover as many as possible during today's webinar. It's so not to take too much time out because it was obviously quite a lengthy and in-depth presentation. I'd like to um, introduce you to our webinar panel. Um, if you've joined us before, they won't be strangers to you. 
But in case you're new to the um, our webinars, welcome. And um, we, today we've got Ian Fairnington, who is our technical director, joining us. Morning, Ian. Morning, Pam. Morning, everyone. Uh, didn't quite hear that, but that might be me. Um, we've got Linda Key, who is um, one of our technical sales managers. And Linda covers the Scotland and North England sections of the UK. Morning, Linda. Morning, Pamela. Morning, everyone. And uh, we've also got uh, Callum Anderson, who is our technical researcher and works with myself and Ian and the technical team. Morning, Callum. Good morning, Pam. Good morning, everyone. Um, we will try and work this the best that we can. Unfortunately, I have got no audio coming from any of the team here. So um, we will see how we get on here trying to do this. Go on, I'm just warning you if there's any glitches. Okay, if we can move to the questions. Um, Ian, can I start with you if you don't mind? We've got one there on the YouTube feed from Linda Young. Um, is class A better than class B? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Pam. That's a, a great question. Um, I think the presentation did show the class A to class F. Um, class A being non-combustible, uh, A1, um, <clears throat> and then various grades down. Um, so in terms of class, class A is above class B. Um, but to use a typical technical term, um, uh, it depends. Um, class A is, is, is ultimately what a lot of people strive for, but striving for that class A does affect other parameters as well. So you can strive for class A in terms of fire performance, but that could then limit its vapor permeability, um, <clears throat> its water resistance. So to get that class A, it's got to be dealt, dealt with holistically, make sure that you've got a healthy building and that the fire requirements are, are taken into consideration but also what else you need from a membrane. So class B can be good. Um, you saw in the, the, the seminar, there's various different types of class B. So the Edinburgh University test we did, which is a fantastic piece of work, where you've got two class A products, but they reacted very much differently to fire. Um, one was uh, obviously an intumescent product, one wasn't, and the fire performance was extremely different. So, yeah, as always, call the tech desk. Um, you've got three of the members here in the in the in the uh, panel here, but you also, if you need a visit, you've got Linda there if you're in Scotland, and we've got lots of other people uh, in southern areas. Excellent. So, call us. Thanks, Ian. You'll be glad to know I have can now hear everybody. So um <laughs> it bodes well for the rest of it. This um, me worrying I... about my my computer. <laughs> I'm blaming it. I'm in your office, Ian, so I'm blaming it on that. Um, I was say it looks very nice. <laughs> um just before we move on to, to a question for you, Linda, um Scotty W one hundred, you um posted a question for us. It's great. Could you clarify a little bit more on the construction that you're putting that into your build up just so that um we can we can answer that more effectively for you that would be great right linda just to get you warmed up and um, we've got a question here that's come in uh, from youtube um no i did have it there we go it's from emma mcdonald and she asked can different substrates have an effect on the fire performance of the membrane so this links quite nicely to what ian was just saying yeah, I was just thinking that like links on quite well. Yeah, different substrates do have a different effect on the fire performance of a membrane. So we've went and done further testing with our product Raptite just to have a look at this sort of scenario. So when we tested it onto, say, calcium or cement-based sheathing boards, the test results reflected uh, from the free hanging with collaboration achieved Class B. But then when we actually went on to test it on, say, like a wood particle board, that result was totally different. It was a lower performance. So it was like a class D, S1, D0. Um, but 
that's not to say it limits the use over 11 metres. It's important to understand your full system buildup, if you like, when specifying the membrane. So it's well worth getting in contact with our technical team to go through that. Great. Thank you, Linda. Callum, if I can come to you for the next one, please. Um, this is again one from the, the YouTube feed um, from Cameron Davies. He's asking, we're working on an office block which will be 12 metres tall. What are the fire requirements for the facade that we should be aware of? OK, so there's a few factors that influence that. Um, the first is a, it's an office building. So the more stringent requirements of approved document be applied to buildings that are used for residential purposes and for um, relevant buildings, which are in um, institutions. Um, so an office building wouldn't come into that um, to start with. Further to that, if the building's only 12 metres tall, then it won't have a story above 11 metres, and that's the important factor. Um, so the main requirement that you'll be looking at is the distance that you are from a boundary, in, in which case, the if it's less than a metre, the wall would have to be the external surface of the wall, pardon me, would have to be class B, S3, D2 or better. Otherwise, there's actually no provisions for a particular requirement per approved document B. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Callum. Can I just stick with you, Callum? Uh, we've got a DM in from Keelan Jacobs, and he's asked, why do restrictions start at 11 metres? Okay, so that's actually quite interesting. Um, the fire restrictions that were brought in in 2018 were um, believed to be set at 18 metres because that was the um, highest height of a ladder that fire departments could, um, did have access to at the time. Um, it, it was a wheeled escape ladder with an additional ladder. However, those weren't widely used. In, I believe there was only a few of them in the country. And in, so the, the, updated the updated restriction has been set to 11 metres in, which is it allows for the more standard 13.5 metre and ladder which most fire engines are approved. So it's, re it's really the point at which escaping from a fire be becomes more difficult. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Callum. Linda, can I come back to you, please? we um, got a question in by email um, from Sylvia Fossey. She says, I will be using EPDM at the windows and Raptite is also being used in this area. Can I firstly ask how this works regarding fire performance? And how is the wrap tight normally detailed at this area? So obviously that comes into the air tightness aspect, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, yes, that's actually a really good question. I'm just rattling my brain there, getting the answer for you. Uh, so EPDMs fall into like seals and gaskets categories. So they're actually one of the exceptions that's not required to reach that A2, S1, D0. So we often see the like the wrap type coming into contact with an EPDM like around a window. So to order in order to actually create that sort of continuous airtight layer, if you like, throughout the construction, um, you've got to look at the opening has to be sealed correctly by a suitable EPDM product, if you like. And normally how it's installed is the wrap type is installed first. Uh, up to the opening itself, and then the EPDM is then dressed over the wrap tight. It's commonly about a probably about hundred mil in the in this sort of area. So the wrap tight then ceases to become the breather, if you like, um, but the EPDM takes on that airtight, vapor tight, and it becomes and because it's actually exempt, this means it should satisfy building regulations uh, going forward, but. It's one of those things, if you would like us to look at your details, please get in touch with our technical team or myself. We're happy to go through that with you with the detailing of it. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Linda. And there are some um, EPDMs with less onerous fire loads as part of their systems as well. So there are different options, but yeah, the exemptions there around those windows, it's important to get the weather tightness detail right there. So as you said, Linda, thank you for that. Ian, can we come to you for um, one of the YouTube uh, questions that came in from Michael Stripling, please? Um, is the science behind our construction becoming so complex it negates the economic viability of projects and rendering the regulation and enforcement unenforceable, in fact, impractical to achieve? What a great question for a Friday morning. <laughs> It's a very good question, Michael. Um, sometimes when we see new regulations come in, and sometimes we're involved in them, uh, we do um, start to think how, how complicated does this get? Um, I think 
Michael, the, the best way you can do it is to look at what you want from a construction material or a, or a building and go back to basics. Um, now, that sounds strange given the question you've asked about it being complex. But I think you need to go back to basics and ask what you want from that building. And then as you go through each layer, how that complies with approved document B regulations or any of the approved documents, how it affects it. It's a very good question. It can be complicated. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, again, I'll say to you that there's three on the panel here that can help. And Linda's more than capable than dealing with technical questions as well. So we do look at it holistically. It is complicated sometimes, but you just need to go back to basics and then work through how that affects the approved documents um, or technical standards, depending on which country you're in. Great. Thanks, Ian. Um... Thanks um, to Scotty for uh, updating and adding a bit more context. So Callum, can I come to you to have a look at this? Because as Ian said, this is the, the type of question we deal with on a, a daily basis and technical. So um, the question was, first of all, in two phases, my question is if employing an internal AVCL, primary vapor permeable membrane, and then foil faced insulation, would you expect it to be protected by a secondary vapor? permeable membrane BPM. And so it was just a sort of a general question about placements of membranes, not project specifics, but typically relating to two wall types constructed off site, so timber frame panels and light gauge steel. And um, so if you can tackle that one, Callum, that'd be great. Okay, so a vapor permeable membrane and a vapor control layer do two very different things. The vapor control layer is of course preventing any moisture from in the building from permeating out and into the wall construction. The vapor permeable membrane is protecting that construction from uh, things like wind driven rain and weather and even dust. Um, it's, so it's providing that layer of protection outside of the frame rather than in preventing the water, water vapor from moving into it. Um, it can also provide an extra layer of air tightness if you're using things like our wrap tape. Um, so yes, in, in most frame constructions, you do want both a vapor control layer and a uh, breathing membrane. That's great, thanks. You. I mean, yeah, I, I'm just going to jump in because I'm going to use Ian's favourite phrase, it, it depends as well. So things like foil faced insulations obviously have an inherent degree of vapour resistance in themselves. So it may be that you can either downgrade or relocate or look at something. So it's very much a case of come and have a chat with us um, and, and we can have a look at that. Or, you know, as I mentioned before, pop into our members area play about with your constructions in our condensation and you value software there. So you'll get a good idea of how your, your wall constructions, if you're developing something, um, reacts. And then you can also send them to us for, for checking and approval. So it's a good use of our, um, our members area, uh, U value calculator there. Thanks for that, Callum. Okay, um, moving on. Um, Ian, just because you love the BBA, um, Hassan Ahmed, um, on YouTube has asked, on the back of Emma's question, do the BBA certificates advise on the range of suitable and acceptable substrates? Yeah. Um, I think uh, you would have to check each BBA certificate on its own merits. Um, certainly in, in our certificate, it's, it will mention a particular substrate, but not necessarily list them all. Yeah. Um, again, if you phone technical, we'll be able to advise on uh, the typical substrates, depending on which one you're using, um, what the performance will be. Um, so I think BBA give you um, fitness for purpose, um, but can't go into every particular uh, scenario. Um, so maybe just give us an example um, or a typical example, and then go on from there. Um, so yeah, BBA can show suitable purpose. Um, they can be a, a good source of information. Um, so yeah, the, they can be good. Lovely, to answer thank your you. question without going too far in uh, BBA. Okay. <clears throat> Absolutely. Thanks for that, Ian. And if I can stay with you for the next question that's coming um, via uh, DM uh, from Nikesh, 
Do I need an A-rated membrane for my pitched roof? That's getting some good questions today. That's, that's mm -hmm. another good question. Probably one that I think uh, our technical department and Pam Callum, you'll be able to tell us better. Um, something that's getting asked more and more. Um, the difficulty is, um, I think specifiers are getting hung up on the, the fire performance, which you can understand, but it's not all, not everything needs to be non combustible. And certainly in, in pitch roofs, I sit on the NFRC, Slayton and Thailand Committee, we've talked about fire. Fire doesn't really concern Slayton and Thailand because one of the main reasons would be that it's unusual to have pitch roof on an 18 meter building or indeed sometimes 11 meters. So usually it's flat roofs, which is more concerned, but usually it's the primary covering that gives the fire performance rather than under uh, underlays below that. Um, technically it would be difficult to perform an, an underlay that's water resistant, uh, that's vapor permeable enough um, so it's really difficult. So at this stage, you don't need to take the underlay into consideration in the approved documents to comply with them. Great. Thank you, Ian. Okay. Um, there was an email came in from Neil Ferguson um, to us. And I think this one might be quite a good one to actually open up. And if any of the, the, the panel want to make comment on it, they can do. Um, he says, hi, good presentation, many thanks. A few thoughts, please, regarding air leakage into the building elements and the effect on fire performance. The generic question, um, I think he's just looking for some, some thoughts as to how air leakage might affect um, and interact with fire performance. Um, are we talking, sorry, um, just looking for clarity there, are we talking ventilation air gaps in terms of that or is it just air tightness um i mean certainly our uh, air tight vapor control layers can come with fire performance as well um so we've got a class a and we've got a class b fabric um, mm -hmm. depending on what the situations are so that will kill two birds with one stone if you like it will give you some degree of fire performance as well as air tightness. Um, so I, I think it's um, difficult to, to really get into specifics without more specifics, if, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose the thing is, from my point of view, the way I'm reading into it is the fact that penetrations and cabling, etc., coming in out of the building, if they're not treated they would traditionally be an air leakage point. So if you don't seal up a square hole for a round pipe, for example, but then that actually then creates a path for fire to either travel in from outside or vice versa. So yeah, it's probably really important if you've got a building that what you do is like twofold that it actually treats both aspects together um um but yeah again neil if you've got a specific thing that you want to check with us pop us a question any emails to webinar will be um passed on to, to technical to answer as well after the the meeting um, I, would that, I would say that's a great point that you you've mentioned there um the the follow-on trades you could design a building which is perfect in terms of air tightness perfect in terms of fire performance follow-on trades, potentially having to penetrate that area can cause problems. Um, and so the integrity, both in air tightness and fire, can come into it um, with follow-on trades. So yeah, that, that's why follow-on trades in buildings, especially of uh, uh, relevant buildings, um, really need to be managed and supervised really well. Um, to make sure that they're repairing it back to its intended purpose. I think, I think also as well, when you're talking about follow-on trades, it's about getting the people that, that, that do the works, like electricians, plumbers and that, to realise what membranes actually do. 
So it's maybe mm. a bit of education for them as well to help them understand how it all works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of our previous webinars where we spoke with Robertsons about how they've dealt with their passive house schools mm -hmm. are really good. And, and certainly St Sidwell's as well, where, you know, these buildings engaged with their contractors and got them on board and did a lot of upskilling and, um, you know, passport schemes and things like that, which meant that, you know, these guys have got some really good skills to take forward and it meant they delivered very high performing buildings at the end of it. Thank yeah, you. That's education they can take forward into their next construction. So it's absolutely, really absolutely. Ian, sorry, can I come back to you? There's quite a few questions that um, fit into to, to your knowledge set. <laughs> um, this is an email that's come in from Oliver Gibb. Could be quite a controversial one, and I appreciate this might be personal opinion. But is fire resistance in a membrane more important than air tightness? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a personal opinion. Um, it can be very controversial to, to be able to answer that one, um, especially given recent events or maybe not so recent, the, the Grenfell Inquiry. Uh, the, that particular case was, was really difficult. And... I think the construction industry has really upped its game um, in the majority of cases and really improved the fire performance of a lot of materials and really educated themselves a lot better than previous regulations. Uh, so there's more uh, emphasis on that. Um, personally, I would say, although fire is important, um, I think air tightness could be argued to be more important um, air tightness starts day one when you move into the building and has an effect on how that building functions, how it breathes, how it's energy efficient. Um, so there's a lot of parameters from day one with air tightness that can be taken into consideration. With the fire performance, um, it's equally important, but it's more about what I would consider an insurance um measure uh, so you need to take the fire performance into consideration you need to do the things that is required of the proof document however you hope that you'll never ever need them um so that's why i'm referring to it as an insurance doc uh, so you take out your car insurance and you hope you never have a crash but if you do then you know you've got cover i would say fire performance is similar to that so you take all the fire precautions hope that you would never, ever need it. But if you do, you've got a backup that the building will perform. So I would tend to think air tightness is more important, but I'm saying that quietly just to avoid people shouting at me later on. I'm now looking at the YouTube feed to see if it goes better. <laughs> With a can of worms. However, you can get some products that can do both of that, like our ProBreathe A2, you can get good air tightness as well as fire performance, which leads me very nicely into a question that I've got here for Linda. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, this, is coming, <laughs> this is coming from Valentina by DM. Is ProBreathe A2 the same install as Raptite? Uh, in one word, no. <laughs> That's easy way to put it. Uh, ProBreathe is like a partially fixed membrane. So you're using a combination of tapes when you're looking at Pro Day 2. So you're looking like we have an FR duo tape and we have the FR tape. So the duo is just as it sounds. It's a double-sided tape, which you bond the membrane back to the substrate. And then when you're actually on your overlaps, you've got the FR single-sided tape. So that's basically to maintain the air tightness, if you like, negate the wind effect in the membrane once it's installed. And then it's also important to remember this membrane has been tested in free hanging and installed. So it achieves classification A2S1D0 on both circumstances, in both circumstances. But we have all like the install guides uh, on the website. You can just go in and download them. Um, any sort of data sheets there, there as well, or just phone up uh, technical to get them. Okay. 
Thanks, Linda. Yeah, certainly the aerated membranes are less um, dependent in their performance on substrates um, because they are inherently non or extremely limited um, energy and combustibility within them. Um, Alan, can I come to you, please, with another A2 product from our range question? Um, this is from Bartek. Um, he's asking, will adding Protec A2, so that's our AVCL, to my building provide an hour's resist fire resistance? No, um, no membrane will be able to do that. Um, membranes are very thin things, and fire resistance is based on a couple of factors. So it needs structural integrity. So that's saying, uh, will the product hold up in terms of a fire and not let fire pass through? Which, yes, the ProCheck is likely to do so for a given time. But it also needs thermal isolation. So um, it, it needs to be able to prevent the heat from where the fire is to, and get in from getting to where the fire isn't, which any membrane wouldn't be able to do. It's, as I say, it's um, less than a millimetre thick. It, you would have heat on both sides and then a fire could start on the other side. Okay, great. Thanks, Callum. And to round off the subject of membranes and fixings, etc. Ian, can I come to you? Um, it's another uh, DM in from Chandra. Um, do you consider? Do sorry, I'll start that again. Do you need to consider tapes in reaction to fire tests? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, theoretically. Tapes could be deemed to be an accessory, and therefore it could be deemed to be exempt from the proof document. Um, and, and and that would be would be right, um, similar to the the question Linda dealt with with EPDMs. But certainly at Proctors, we tend to like to test the system. So if we use a tape with a ProBreeze, for example, as Linda mentioned. We'd like the test done on the system um, rather than just the uh, membrane itself. So theoretically, um, you don't need to, um, but I think best practice would be to always have the installed system test so that you're, you're taking into consideration the full fire performance. Absolutely. Thank you. Um Callum, can I come to, to you for one for the, the YouTube? We'll, we'll pull up some of them um, now. Um, M. Abdullah Quandri, I do apologise, my pronunciation and names, including my own, is uh, rookie at the best of times. Um, they've asked, EPDM is not fire rated. Will it work when we have fire disaster? Won't it become a fuel to the fire? So it so some EPDMs are fire rated. Um, I know there are some that are class B and some may be better than that. Um, the other main uh, point of consideration is that EPDMs are typically used as sealants, um, which are um, they're excluded from the fire regulations. They don't require that same requirement. Um, so yes, it, it could add fuel to the fire, but it's considered uh, not not significant amount or that there's not really a good way around that. Yeah. I think possibly sometimes in some areas um, and some parts of the world, you may use an EPDM as a full weather system on a wall. Um, and in that case, that is a lot of um, fuel. Where we're talking about using it alongside our membranes, it is literally for that weather weather tight seal around windows, which um, when you consider the sort of summers we get is, is really critical. So as you said, Callum, isn't it? And Linda touched on it, it's used in small small quantities and quite often mm -hmm. in conjunction with things like fire breaks and, and cavity closers around those um, elements. So hopefully the risk um, of spread is limited. And as I said, a lot more um, fire rated EPDMs are coming onto the market as well that can help to to mitigate that um, that fuel load, that um, calorific content of the, the EPDMs. Thank you, Callum. So I jumped on that a bit as well. <laughs> um, Neil, uh, who was asking about like um, air earlier, Neil Ferguson, his email, he's given us some some more detail where it was more about the membranes and penetration. So hopefully we, we've touched on that um, already in our discussions where 
obviously, if you've got large scale penetrations through things like nail holes aren't and fixings aren't as bad unless they're taken out, in which case remediate them. And you can get there's a wide range of intumescent sealants um, and, and fillers that you can use to, to detail these areas. Um, as well as within our wrap type range, we've got our, our liquid flashing that can be used. So if there's a specific detail you want us to look at, drop us an email and, and we can we can talk you through that. Um, Ian, um, because you're involved in the R&D side, um, can I pass you George Simpson's question from YouTube, please? Um, it, it's kind of sort of like, He's got a few questions, so we'll, we'll deal with the first one first. Um, is the wrap type fabric itself flame retardant, or does the product require the inclusion of FR additives to meet the class B? Um, I'm going to say it depends. Um, again, um, you can see why I'm not on the tech desk all the time. Um, so, yeah, it depends on, on what the fabric's made of. So if you've got a glass fibre, product, uh, woven glass fibre, which is typical now with some of the fire performance membranes. Um, that itself will have a very good fire performance. Um, so in itself, it'll perform as a vapor permeable membrane. Probably won't be W1, probably be W2. So therefore, um, you have to consider that in terms of what water resistance you need. Some membranes, uh, polypropylene, non-woven polypropylenes, because they're polyprops, tend to have fire performance in them um, and have to be added to them. Uh, so to answer it, it is, depends. Uh, it depends on the performance you require and depends on what the base material is made of. That's great. Thanks, Ian. Um, there is some other... George Simpson. Yeah, there's some other ones there. Yeah. So um either Ian or, or Callum, um, if you want to answer these ones, we'll take the next one. Um, if air tightness is provided from the external of the building with no EVC VCL internally, how does uncontrolled air movement into the between frame insulation impact on thermal performance? Callum, you look at this quite a lot in Woofies. Do you want to take that one for George? Uh, yes. So in it doesn't really affect the overall building's um, air tightness. It can affect the unit to unit building. If you have, um, for example, two flats beside each other, you wouldn't have much um, providing air tightness between them. But in terms of the overall building's air tightness, it, does, it, it, it doesn't really affect, affect the fact that there's air movement in that frame. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's a significant factor. I think it depends as well, George, just to jump on this as well, um, on your placement of the insulation. So in a lot of cases where we're using um, Raptite or, or ProBreathe as the AVCL externally, the majority of the insulation is placed externally. So your frame um, may be empty if it's an SFS or it may have limited um, mineral wool in there for, for acoustics. So. A lot will depend on how well that is installed um, and also on um, how well your plasterboard, et cetera, is jointed and, and again, those internal lines are detailed. But because that frame is kept warm because the majority of the insulation external, although there's a bit of air movement, it's less critical from the point of view of condensation risk um, within those areas. And because there's then no influence from outside, it's it's really just what air movement is provided from inside the building. So it's certainly consideration, but that's where it comes down to on-site detailing and quality of that detailing rather than um, sort of any sort of drastic um, effect on it. Um, but again, it's it's the it depends on the construction aspect of it. So vapor controllers are always good, if nothing else, to to control um moisture movement uh, in that section rather than just relying on it solely for for the um, air tightness point of view. Um, Ian, do you want to have a a look at this one uh, again, uh, George's one um, on why is air tightness externally important for a wall but not with a roof? With the roof shield, you have the opposite with air permeability because it's an extremely air permeable product. 
given um so um he says given that surface penetration can still occur at ceiling level still so it's really about air tightness and how you detail it in in a roofing application yeah it, it, it's a great question that george has asked i think i would ask the question who said that it wasn't important in roofs um we just concentrate on walls obviously today's presentation but it can be very important in in roofs as well um UK, um, we tend to go with cold pitch roofs, um, which most Europeans think we're crazy for having a dry space just to keep your suitcases and uh, your Christmas tree in. So the cold pitch roof, we tend to concentrate on air permeability. And that's the reason roof shields are so popular in that circumstance, because you don't need to ventilate. Um, However, it is important from an air tightness point of view, especially in warm roofs, as to what you use in the warm roof. We tend to use the vapour control air on the un underside of the insulation. Um, it's arguable that it's better to have an air tight membrane in, in those circumstances rather than air permeable um, because you're, you're improving the air tightness similar to the way you're doing the walls. So, I think well, roofs are important, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you're looking at a passive house, for example. You definitely need to take that into consideration. And it's not just walls that get passive house. Um, and you're right, there is a lot of penetrations in the ceiling. And you should either consider that and design it out. Or if you've got it there, uh, adapt it to make sure that you can still have that aesthetic penetrations, um, but still keep your air tightness. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, Callum, can I come to you? Um, Scotty W100 on YouTube's asked on fixing secondary BPMs, how are they fixed over mineral wool insulation? Okay, so there's a variety of uh, methods that can be used. Um, you could use a uh, mushroom fixing, such as it would be used to fix the insulation itself. Um, we've seen some projects using stick pins, so the pins that are adhered to the substrate behind the insulation. The insulation fitted onto that and then that used to hold the membrane as well. Um, obviously with our Raptite or Raptite UV you can adhere to the uh, mineral wool, although it's not as good as with a solid substrate, but um, there are a variety of methods that can be used. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Linda, could, could I ask you to um, answer Michael Stripling's uh, question from YouTube? And I know you can manage this because you're, you're good in your Raptite. Does self-adhesive raptite negate the need to be perfect in sealing membranes at difficult junctions and obstructions that often are not easily accessible? <laughs> um, yes, raptite can reach most inaccessible areas. Um, you have to be careful when you're applying raptite that you make sure that the seal is pressurised down. So normally we would ask people to use like a roller to get the correct pressure. So if you're moving from one area to say you're moving from say like timber to concrete or something like that, you have to make sure that you get that pressure seal to make sure that it's down. But it can be manoeuvred quite easily around areas. Um, normally, it would take maybe two people to help manoeuvre it round. Um, but yes, you can do that. It's quite simple to do. Uh, we do quite a lot of um, site visits where we go out and we look at the detailing of how these projects are. And we can advise if that's correct or if you would need to do some sort of remedial work to make sure that the seal's correct. I hope that's answered the question. Well done, Linda. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Linda. And I think also with the wrap tight, it's worth knowing that we do um, tapes as well. So tapes yeah. and corners and liquid flashing to make that detailing easier. So sometimes if you've got a hard to treat area rather than trying to take a full sheet of loose membrane or even self-adhesive membrane into it, detail it with like a, a you know a thick 300 mil or 200 mil wide tape that you can then lap and joint on to. That's right. Um, sometimes it's smaller just areas wrap tight. Yeah. So wrap yeah. tight, cut down to size. Yeah. Um, and I think people think there's like standard sizes, but they're not. They can be specific to your projects. So don't feel like you just have to buy 300 mil. If you need 225, that is easy enough done. Yeah. 
for us. Absolutely. Yes, I was on site the other day and we were talking about uh, liquid flashing and they're going, what's that? Can we use that? Yes, yes, you can use that. Yeah. <laughs> and Absolutely. bite some things off, yeah. That's it. It's a great one for um, for detailing around penetrations yeah. to, to reduce your ear leakage side of things. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, uh, Callum, I've got one in um, from email here from Artie Coleman. It's asking, I'm using vapour control layers and wanted to know what you can offer in terms of fire rated vapour control layers. So I think we've touched on one or two of them earlier on. Uh, yes, I believe we have. So we have our two options. We have our Protec FR200, which is a BS1D0. And then at the higher end of things, we have our Protec A2, in, which has a much higher vapour resistance and, as the name suggests, is an A2. S1 D0 fire rated membrane. That's great, thank you. And if I can stay with you with George's one, because you are our go-to Woofie guy. Um, he says, thank you for the answers, guys. One more on Woofie assessment. Are you carrying out um, 2D analysis or Woofie Pro 1D analysis? We use one-dimensional analysis. Um, so uh, we're mostly concerned with the, um, the considerations through the wall itself. So we don't really look at junction, junctions or approaches as much. That's great. Thanks, Callum. Um, Ian, I think I've got one more question here that I nearly missed from the YouTube feed. I was just scanning through. And then if there's any other questions, guys, it's your last call, because I think this is our last one. Um, Bino said in YouTube, too many people are getting hung up on part B and combustibility. They are becoming blind to other technical considerations, in my experience as a severe with a well-known warranty provider. Thoughts? Um, I would agree with you, uh, Bino. Um, I think I, I, I touched on that earlier that when I was asked about, I think it was air tightness versus fire performance. Um, you're right, you can get too hung up on it and you have to take everything into consideration. And at Proctors, we, we tend to take things into consideration. So what might be work in terms of fire performance, we would then have to advise, well, yes, that will meet the requirements of the approved document, but it might have other implications elsewhere in terms of your condensation. And as Pam said, we've got our resident uh, WIFI guy here that could do a WIFI cal column. Um, so we would take that into consideration. So you're right, you can get too hit up or focused on fire performance, but fire performance is just one thing that you have to take into consideration, and there's many others as well. So um, if in doubt, then uh, phone the tech desk. Thank you, Ian. And a uh, huge thanks to all of our panel, to Ian, Linda and Callum. Um, thanks to everybody that's tuned in and asked some questions. There have been some brilliant ones today that have really challenged everybody. So um, it's what we thrive on. We like it when we get questions like this that tax our brains. If you do have any more questions, please do pop us all an email to webinar at proctorgroup.com. Or if you've got something for technical directly, feel free to email us at technical at proctorgroup.com and, and we'll answer your questions in specifics. Um, so thanks everybody uh, there. Uh, thank you very much to all the behind the scenes team that keep these running smoothly uh, and put them on. Now is the time to register for our next webinar, um, which is on Friday the 29th of September, same time, 10 a.m., same place. And that one is entitled Products in Practice, Bower House in Barking. So in from that is Raptite is the only self-adhering vapor permeable air barrier certified by the BBA and combines the critical properties of vapor permeability and air tightness, which we touched on today, in one self-adhering membrane. This approach saves on both the labor and material costs associated with achieving the energy efficiency demands in buildings. The Raptite external air barrier system from the A Proctor Group has been installed in combination with the innovative and unique comfort frame internal wall insulation system to deliver impressive energy efficiency savings to a housing retrofit project. This is the Bower House one. So the webinar will cover the following topics, the use of wrap type membrane with an internal wall insulation system, the project planning and design that went into this project, um, integrating the MVHR into retrofit, 
and the on-site project delivery and installation. So it's going to be a really interesting one. And I think there's going to be a round table later in the year with this one as well. Um, so there will be a live Q&A as always after this session, um, the webinar next month with some of our technical experts. I'll be hosting that one again and joining you. And we will also have some special guests from guests from Comfort Frame themselves that you can um, bombard with your questions about their system. So register now to make sure you don't miss out. And that can be done at proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar, or will be very shortly. So if you've enjoyed this webinar, please give us a thumbs up and um, look at su subscribing to our um, website um, and our YouTube channel. Um, and just you know, keep in touch there and any feedback, fill in feedback form, we do take that on board. We do appreciate that some people had some audio um, glitches today with it fading in and out um, and notwithstanding my user issue at the start, but hey, we're here now. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you again for joining us and uh, have a lovely weekend and we'll see you next month. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.